Thank you very much. So, I think I have the opportunity to talk on a topic that's uh, very important to me. So, um, I've been working on that probably for the last 10 years now. And um, I think like really making sure that, very similar to what Liv talked about, how can we use OSM for autonomous, also it's very important for us, how can we use OSM for automotive, for car navigation, safety features in cars, and then ultimately, of course, autonomous as the holy grail of, of navigation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But first of all, I want to give a very quick um, introduction what, uh, what Talanov is and what I'm doing there, and then I'll deep dive into um, into the topic. So, um, Telenov is a Silicon Valley based company um, founded about 20 years ago with a mission to make um, smartphone navigation accessible to people, which again right now sounds very common, but uh, Telenov is one of the inventors of navigation on phones. Um, and Telenov shifted in the last few years to um, automotive navigation, so our bread and butter business is we are power navigation for all Fords um, in many of the GM cars that you can get for some Toyotas in North America. So that's the business that our company is. And I'm in charge at the Global Engineering Group at Telenav. So about 400 people and we have about 60 people working on OpenStreetMap. I joined the company due to an acquisition. I started an OpenStreetMap based navigation company in Europe and four years ago sold that to, to Telenav. So I've been personally like 10 years now into the OpenStreetMap space and trying to make um, navigation happen. And again, what, what really our vision is right now, we really want to make sure that OSM to power automotive navigation. OSM has had an incredible amount of wins across all other industries, but in automotive navigation right now, it hasn't arrived yet. And I want to talk a little bit about why this is and how we'll get there. And first of all, I want to give a little bit of an introduction and like also share a little bit the history that I have in OSM, right? So when I first started Scobbler and we went into OSM, I was at Navigon, which uh, was later acquired by Garmin. It was one of the prime navigation providers like back in the days. And like our colleagues, when we said like we'll go to do like navigation with OSM, they all laughed. They said like we are crazy. OSM is like a display map. It can never power navigation. It'll never be good enough. And I think that's been the journey for OSM, right? Like whenever, like in the beginning, people said you cannot even use it for map rendering. Then suddenly it was pervasive and was everywhere in map rendering. Then people said you cannot use it for navigation. Now it's like very common to be used in navigation by millions of people around the world. Then they said, well, but you cannot use it for automotive because you have higher safety standards. People are going to die if the system is not gone work. Um, and I think that's what we need to make happen now and need to prove them that we're not killing people with our maps. So I think that's kind of the objective which we're trying to make OSM at high quality in cars. And, um, and that's what I want to share a little bit, like what do we need to make to make that happen, right? So the big difference is right now, which is like the next barrier of like getting OSM there, which again will end in autonomous, but there's a step before that. So let me, let me give you a few examples. Right now when you have automotive maps, like the biggest differences to what, what OSM has right now, and they have the features and so on, but it's not very commonly used, is just the precision of the maps. So what they have in automotive is what they call ADAS grade map. ADAS is like a safety system, advanced driver assistance systems. So what happens, for example, when your car goes into a curve, it, it, like some of you have a high-end car, depends on what kind of car you have, but then it will change the lights, that it lights into the curve. But for that, it's very important that it has very precision curvature, that it really knows when I change the lights that it basically doesn't kill a pedestrian that's coming because like, it's, it shines some light on that, right? I mean, we've seen that happen with, with like, when you have like, bad maps, then like, basically this kind of things can really happen. And that's kind of where you need to have like, curvature like, at a one degree precision. Or, for example, it changes the engine. I mean, you can save about 5% of fuel if you know that there's a hill coming up and then you change the function of how your engine works and then basically you can save 5% fuel by just by having a more precise map. So therefore you need to have elevation at like a 0.2% accuracy, right? This is kind of things that we need to have and that's what we're kind of working, which is very hard to get with like traditional kind of mapping and that's why like one of the big theses that we have is that we want to augment like human mapping with machine mapping, with using AI algorithms and collect data from millions of vehicles, send them back to the cloud and map them. That's kind of like the barrier that we're trying to have this data collected, but then also make this data available to com the community and keep it open. That's kind of what we see as a barrier to push it to others and autonomous mapping. And I want to share a little bit like what have we done to take steps towards this automotive navigation, what have we achieved so far, and what are the gaps and additional things that we, that we need to achieve. So, 
Uh, one, one thing that I'm incredibly proud of what we've achieved with the team is that in 2015, we launched a broader navigation together with Toyota based on OpenStreetMap here in North America. So Toyota with Entune was the first automotive company which launched an OSM system within their cars. And that was like something that we're like really proud of that they did it. I want to say the system is great, but this is a broadened system, which means it doesn't power any of the safety functions that I just talked about. That's why it's like a first step and it's very important, but it doesn't go to the full length of what I just said as like the full embedded systems that you will see. In 2016, we enhanced the system and launched it for, for, for Canada. Um, and then basically like, I'll show a little bit like on how we went about like adding all the data to Canada and so on and what we worked with, how we worked with the community to do that. And in 2017, we built out the map for Detroit for full embedded navigation. So I think this is like the first city where I would say we have comprehensive coverage of all the attributes we need for the safety system. I'm not talking about the full autonomous level, but for the full other level that I talked about, for the full ability to power other systems, have lane level guidance, all of these advanced features. So we, we work together with a couple of other companies to build out Detroit at, at that level and granularity. And this is obviously we're building it here because here are all the American car companies. So we want to show them it's possible. We haven't built it out at scale because there's still some barriers to that. But at least for Detroit, we now for the first time have it. And now the next step is basically to convince somebody to roll this out in a much broader scale. And I want to share a little bit like how do we think about like statistics? What are kind of things that we are tracking? So this is like what I'm, what I'm talking here now is a lot about like the basic attributes. So of course the first thing that's very important is road geometry. How many miles of roads do we have? In that regard, I can say in most country OSM is now on par or even superior to commercial maps. So I think by simply like covering the roads, OSM is doing fantastic. Having the basic attributes like names on the roads is, is great. But then you can see also like things like turn restrictions, right? That's like for navigation, you need that. It's not a visible attribute for rendering a map, but it's like absolutely important if you want to have navigation and routing even, then you need to be able to know where you're allowed to turn and not. And you can see like if you look at turn restrictions, those in the last two years have almost doubled, right? So I think now we're, we believe like this is what we're talking about, like navigation grade maps, not automotive navigation, embedded maps, but at that, at least also we have achieved like a great level of quality and like one way is the same thing. So this is why we believe now in the US and in generally North America, I mean US and Canada, we believe now at least a navigation grade OSM is definitely viable for full commercial grade navigation because you've seen like in the last two years alone, a lot of these attributes doubled. Um, and I want to share a little bit about our Canada project. When we like, started to analyze Canada three years ago, then we figured out that a lot of these attributes, like turn restrictions, like 90% of them were missing in the map, right? So we had like only 10% covered. And then we started a community effort to do that. So in course of the Canada projects, we have made almost half a million edits. We have touched 51,000 miles of road, which is less than a million miles of road in Canada. So we touched almost, with our mapping team, we touched almost 5% of the whole road network in Canada. We added 50,000 turn restrictions with before that less than 10,000 being in the map. So we've achieved um, a lot of that. We added 20,000 miles of road and we had over a year about like 30 map analysts from our team working full time on, on like mapping Canada to give you a scale of the, of the effort. And of course thousands of community members that, that, that worked on that. So I think that was like a project how we've really proven within like a year how we can together with the community get a whole country from basically being not able to be a navigation grade map with like 90% of turn restriction missing to being like full navigation grade map and being rolled out with Toyota in a broader navigation system. And then I want to go a little bit further to share for, for, for Detroit, like the next level of attributes that we're looking. So you see the basic attributes, which we all also, of course, needed to add. So turn restrictions, you can see also we have like tripled that. We've worked again together with other companies and the community. I'm not saying this is like a tell enough effort. This has always been a collaborative effort with lots of other players. And I'm extremely happy that we see companies like Lyft, Uber, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, that they're all contributing to that. I mean, that's kind of the, the what we want, right? We, we don't want to own any of that. I want that it's open that we can develop services on top of that but we don't want to own the map right that's that's very key so you see the same things improve but then you see also like what's kind of the attributes that I'm talking about next right so then you see like speed limits I mean for safety systems like for advanced cruise control when the system when the car controls how fast you're driving it's very important that there's a speed limit in a map then advanced uh, signs highway exit signs 
or traffic lights, which are used also for safety system. When there's a traffic light coming up, we can warn you that there's a dangerous intersection you need to stop and so on. Or even like things like lane counts, right, where you see like how many lanes does it have, that the car can orient you in the right lane. So this is where you see like a lot of that in a project where we've like covered that has been tremendously improved. And I want to talk a little bit on like how this is possible and what's kind of like how we can really achieve to get to this automotive and at the end autonomous grade maps that I'm talking about. So right now what we do is we have a data collection app, OpenStreetCam, and my colleagues are going to talk more about that during the next days. We collect data from a lot of our uh, cars and phone-based navigation systems. We use GPS traces. Um, we have AI algorithms that use both these probes and these signs to enhance that. And then also, of course, we use data from cars wherever we can um, to really do this at a different level of accuracy. And the reason why cars are very helpful is because in cars you have way more sensors that give you much more precise positioning. So in a traditional GPS, you might have, like depending on what kind of system you have, you might have approximately like five to 10 meters accuracy, which is not enough to position you. And that's like in the best case under open sky. In like an urban setting, you might talk more about like 25 to 50 meters if you look at like an urban canyon with a lot of skyscrapers around, which is not enough to position you at a lane level. But if you have a car, you have, for example, the steering wheel sensor, which gives you like the orientation of the wheels. You have um, gyroscopes in there, which are like way more accurate than any gyroscope you can build in the phone because the phone is very small and very size limited. On the car, you can build a huge uh, six axis gyroscope in there, which gives you positioning down to like tens of centimeters. So that's why it's extremely important to leverage this kind of car data. And that's kind of where we believe that when we can collect this data at scale, and we're talking about millions of vehicles here ultimately, then we can like get to this like 10 centimeter precision that was talked earlier. I think it's like with a phone-based mapping solution, you just cannot achieve that. So that's why you need to have sensors that are way more accurate than that. And that's why we believe really collecting at the end data from cars is where really like the, the next frontier of, of mapping is to achieve a different level of precision. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about OpenStreetCam, which we use. So we've been able to collect 165 million photos um, out of that, approximately 60 million in North America where we did this mapping. Again, all of these pictures is open. The technology is open source, so you can download the client in open source. Even our AI algorithms for the detection is open source, so you can go on GitHub and, and, and download that. And I think that's where you can see like, how our mapping system has traditionally shifted a lot. Originally, a lot of the mapping was done by manually looking at it, but we've collected this data and we've improved our AI technology. So as you can see, this is kind of like how our detection shot up as our AI got better. So we have like started to have like basically most of it manual, and we've detected millions of signs automatically, right? So you can see this is really like where like now the AI shows its power by detecting all of these signs. And all of them that we detect get shared open source with the community wherever we can. We add them directly back to the map ourselves, whenever we use them, we add them back to the map. But where, like in countries where we are not active, for example, we provide them open source because we are not like have a team to like add them everywhere. And that's kind of how our technology evolved. So when we started the effort in like 2017, like our first prototypes were able to detect like 12 signs at about like a 70% accuracy. So it means like when you show it an image, it was like 70% accurate. Right now, we had like 98 signs within like a 95% accuracy. And our goal is basically by, by mid of next year or end of next year, have over 150 signs recognized um, at a 95% plus accuracy. So I think that's when we really see that like all these attributes that are needed for, for autonomous, and that includes like not only signs, that includes also things like lane markings, that includes things like barriers at the side of the road, which are used to orient cars. So that's where we really believe that the interesting things are happening by making sure that these things can be detected automatically because this is just like, if you do this with manual mapping, it's just not scalable, right? I mean, that's the problem that like Liv talked about. I think like we did like an, an early calculation before we had the AI, and then we were looking at thousands of map years to map North America. And like, I mean, at least as tell enough, we're too small to afford that, even if I would really like to spend that money, but probably I'll get fired if I hire like a thousand map editors. Um, I, I welcome all the bigger companies to do that. They can maybe afford it. So maybe Lyft can hire a thousand people. That's great. Um, and I would really commend that. But like, unless, unless, like, unless we find like uh, pots of gold lying around here, then probably we have to figure out how to do it with AI and humans together. 
um, and not only rely on humans to do it. And I think that's really what we see, that we see that we are like on the cusp of like making ma mapping by a factor 10 or 100 more efficient than it's based on purely human mapping. So I think that's what we're really, what we're really driving. So this is kind of what, what we want to achieve, what I, what I talked about. We really want to leverage the connected cars as passive map makers, right? So we want that, like, even if you're not an OSM mapper, if you're driving around, your car detects stuff, we can upload it to the cloud, we can make sure that we aggregate it and analyze it, share it back with the, with the community, and then basically have a system which means more that humans are there to validate and make sure that the AI doesn't do like crazy stuff, but instead of having to do all the grunt work to like find everything and map it in the first place. And we see that also like by, by doing this, if you have like thousands of cars driving on the same road, you can also basically get much, much higher precision because if, even if one car has an error rate of a few percent and detects a sign like a 10, 20, 50 centimeters off, if you have a lot of trips, you can basically average out the position and that way, get to maps that are much, much more precise. So I think really what, 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 we want, what, what I want to say, it's not like, I don't think it's like man versus the machine. I think it's really man and the machine. And I think really this AI mapping can make mapping lives much, much more fun. So I think we're investing a lot in writing the right tooling and making sure that both the community as well as our internal map editors can leverage this. So this is really where we, we're working on. And I mean, we're an automotive company, so what we also need to do is we really need to jointly convince the big car makers that OSM is safe, that it is a sound map to bat on, because right now there's a lot of other companies who are trying similar things in a non-open fashion. And I think what really my personal goal is really that we can make sure that open wins, right? Because right now, as you see, a lot of these HD map companies, they're operating completely in closed source technology. They're keeping all of that proprietary. And if you look right now, if you look at the HD maps, at the semi-autonomous maps in the market that you have, you see like Tesla. Tesla doesn't open source this map. Um, GM has like Super Cruise, which is a semi-autonomous technology. It's not open. Um, like uh, Google, obviously, Waymo doesn't have any of its technology in the open. So I think if you look at that, then there's a real threat that like open might not win. I think like open will win, and I think there's enough investment into that. But that's kind of what, um, what we are hoping, that we can convince these companies to contribute that in the open instead of keeping it closed and rather fight some bigger enemies like Google or so on who are like keeping their data closed and having it open and making sure that not only display maps but also like driving maps, autonomous maps are open. And um, I think that's kind of like what, what, um, what I want to close with, right? So I think I really... Um, invite all of you to contribute to the thing. So as I said, OpenStreetCam, you can download the app, you can drive around, you can hook it up to your car with an OBD2 dongle to read some of the more advanced sensor data out that I was talking ab about. Um, you can download our AI algorithms, improve them, find some additional detections that you want to add. Um, of course, you can help with any kind of editing. And we're, um, yeah, and I think like you can just help us basically to, to make, make all of that happen. And I think really, what we want to do is we want to do this together, right? We want to do this with the OSM community, with all of the companies in the ecosystem. So our fundamental view is that we are not like competing. I mean, we are really like, we all have our, our goals and we all need to commercially make money to be viable companies. But at the end, I think it's like the more companies in the ecosystem, the better. Um, and I hope really that we can convince the OSM, OEMs, the big car companies, where I know that some of the people in, are in Detroit are coming here to join these kind of talks, we hope that we can convince them to really put OSM there, and hopefully then we can make automotive navigation and autonomous cars with OSM happen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Um, we have uh, about five minutes for questions. Uh, see. Sure. I love the village, the vision that you're painting. But what do you think are the biggest challenges we face as a community to to have an open future with HD live updating maps? Um, I, w I would say there is two kinds of challenges. Um, one of the challenges is that some of the data that is like this more technical challenge and I think that's easier to solve, that some of the data that you need is not easily representable within OSM 
because OSM has an approach that fundamentally only fact-based stuff is in the map, right? Like OSM has this ground truth rule, which for autonomous doesn't really apply. So let's say, um, and, and, and doesn't apply even for automotive navigation fully. So let's, let, let me like give an example, right? Like how the problem that I shared with GPS earlier, GPS is not very precise in positioning. So how the auto, autonomous vehicles hack it is they basically make a footprint of what's happening around and basically do triangulation. So they would say on the left side, there is a, is a rail, there's this traffic light and they, they built this what they call like roadside furniture. So it's kind of an imprint that you can localize yourself um, locally. And that kind of stuff, for example, since Basically, if you detect it with a car, it's never fact-based. It's like approximately correct, but it's not like an exact representation of the real world. So this is like one of the examples. Other things is like, what's the average movement speed on a, on a, on a road, right? That's not a fact. I cannot scientifically prove you that Monday morning at 9 o'clock at that road, cars are driving 25 miles an hour. And that's things that's right now not represented in OSM. So I think that's like one of the challenge, that there's just some layers that work different than OSM works on a technical level. So I think that's the technical challenge that we need to make sure that those kind of attributes get represented in OSM. Um, that's one part of the challenge. The other part of the challenge is more like a, a process challenge, right? Right now, we don't want that anybody does like automated edits for, for OSM. But if you look at like autonomous vehicles, you will need this really high frequency kind of updates where I think we would need to have like a separate layer or something like that where you basically can have that automated edits that basically cars can read through, right? So I think that's like the two, I think, big challenges. How can we ensure that OSM can represent these non-factual things and how we can represent like more kind of real-time data that is machine generated and not human validated. And it doesn't need to be part of the base map and maybe it doesn't need to be part of OSM at all, but it needs to be somewhere if you really want to make it a viable option for this kind of things. And right now, what happens, most companies build this layer separately, right? So I think like, because it doesn't belong into OSM, but if we really want to make it fully open, then I think that's the two challenges which we have. And of course, I mean, we have to convince the car makers that we are a viable community who's doing this and things like that. But I think that's, that's easier. But the two big challenges are the ones that I mentioned earlier. Any other questions? Sure. Go ahead. Hello. Um, I'll just say this. Hi, I'm Ariel. I'm from the US Department of Transportation. So you also have to convince us, but I'm here because I want to be convinced. So um, hi, everybody. Um, for state and local government um, as well, uh, is there any thought that you all have about getting more real-time data from them? Um, and, and how does that fit into this picture? Um, so first of all, thank you for joining here. I think it means a lot. I think it's really a great sign that you're here and engaging with the community, so I really do appreciate that. Um, and like to your question, with engaging with like local governments. So for example, in our Canada project, we did this, right? Like we worked with, with uh, local authorities that had open data and the trend that more municipalities release like open data is fantastic and it's helping, helping like OpenStreetMap a lot. So I think there's a lot of engagements happening. Um, and I think that, that will be more and more. So I think like basically when, um, when regions, cities, governments, like release their data in the open, that makes the life of everybody like much, much easier. And um, yeah, and I mean, I I'm definitely hope that like the community, us as companies can work more and more with, with governments who are providing open data. And hopefully we can provide value back to the government by giving the data back and making sure that you can also use it for useful things that you do. So I'm definitely hoping that we can engage more. We have another question over here. Sorry, uh, I just want to know how you verify this uh, uh, stuff when you're using like AI te technology or stuff that you get information from this. Uh, yeah. yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, it means how do we verify the information? So right now we don't add anything to OpenStreetMap where not a human editor has looked at. So what we do right now, our AI does a detection and then a human looks at it and says, like, is the AI correct? And only then we add it to the map. So right now we don't like do any like automated map editing. So we have always a human editor verifying it. But again, like what I shared earlier, you get like an order of magnitude more efficiency, right? It's very different when I have a human look at an image, detect the sign, put it in the map, 
versus I have an AI detecting it, like generating a change set, and then a human just looks at it and says, yeah, that looks right, click, edit the map, right? So, but I think ultimately, if the AI is good enough, maybe we can remove that step. But I think that's a, a discussion we need to have with the community. Right now, the AI is not good enough. Right now, we still have like a 5% error rate, so I wouldn't even suggest that we automatically edit the map. But once the AI is good enough, then we can have that conversation. But right now, basically, the AI is doing pre-detection, and the humans verify. And we do even things like, for example, for our automotive kind of stuff in Detroit, we even send people with high-precision GPS recorders to measure the road and see, like, what do we detect as curvature? Is that correct, right? So we do some ground truth evaluations where we send people, measure it, and see if what we detect is correct. That's how we basically build the baseline, measure it, and then like improve our technology over time and then measure it against like ground truth. Any more questions? Sure. Hi, so in the presentation you said the Detroit map uh, in OSM is actually good for embedded navigation. So how did you uh, prove that is a true statement? Thank you. Well, we're providing navigation system for some of the biggest cars, so we just put it in an embedded navigation system and drive it like side by side with uh, non-OSM maps. And uh, basically, the summary is you, like, you see that it works very well, right? So we just put it in an embedded car navigation system because that's what we do as a company, and then just benchmarked it against other systems, and then we found out that it's very good. So I think that's how we did it, by basically measuring the end user experience in an embedded car navigation system. But at the end, when you really want to prove it, you need to do what I said earlier. You really measure the map. You take like the ground truth, you send somebody, measure somebody, and say, like, I need to have one meter accuracy, so you need to go along the road, measure, do you have that achieved? That's how you can measure it. But we did it more from the user experience side. All right, any final questions? Um, I, have, I have one more to add. Uh, the dash cam program, um, is, that, is that still ongoing right now? And, and, and what are you guys using it for? How do you see that? as a success in, in going forward with the community members. Yes, so what we, what we did is for OpenStreetCam, um, because like putting your smartphone there every time when you drive is a lot of effort, we produced together with a, with a partner, we produced a dedicated OpenStreetCam dash cam, and um, we're, um, we produced like a few hundred of those devices, and uh, we have them on a community land out program, so I think you can uh, see our booth over there if you want to have one of those dash cams. You can put it in your car and then you basically, whenever you're driving, it automatically collects the imagery. If you have a Wi-Fi in your garage, it automatically uploads it once you hit that garage. So that, that is still going on and we're still learning and evolving around that. So we have dash cams and if somebody is interested in having one, they can reach out to our booth, can reach out to Martin uh, over there and get one of those dash cams to start uh, contributing to that. And yeah, I think that's still, that's been a big success. So we have, we're collecting a big part of our imagery now with these dedicated dash cams. All right, well, thank you, Philip. Um, we're gonna break for a little bit and we'll be back in a half hour. <laughs>